Hi everyone, my name is Nick Marshall and I'm the head of exhibitions and programs here at the George Eastman Museum. Thank you all for joining us today. Today's program, Photographing for the Colorama Campaign with Steve Kelly, is part of our In Focus series, which provides a deep dive into a variety of different topics uh, and different projects going on around the museum. Uh, that are usually led by staff or researchers or just some of our uh, closest collaborators here at the museum. The topic of tonight or today's conversation, Colorama, uh, was one of Eastman Kodak Company's longest running advertising campaigns. First conceived in 1949, these massive backlit transparencies were designed to demonstrate the brilliance of color photography. And they were also used to adver advertise Kodak's color film products to a mass market. Between 1950 and 1990, a new colorama was installed every few weeks in Grand Central Terminal in New York City, resulting in a total of 565 colossal transparencies. In 2020, the Harcourt M. and Virginia W. Sylve Sylvester Foundation very generously funded uh, the construction of the structure that displays the Eastman Museum's reproduction, Colorama, and the installation of the Taj Mahal image that we're all here uh, to learn about today. Their support is especially meaningful as the Sylvester families association with the original Colorama and George Eastman himself all began many decades beforehand. The Sylvester family descends from Waldo B. Potter. Some of you probably maybe know that name better as Pete Potter, uh, who was the distinction, uh, I'm sorry, Pete Potter, who had the distinction of working for George Eastman at the Eastman Kodak Company early in his career. As a Kodak vice president years later, Pete Potter imagined and realized the series of Colorama images that were installed in Grand Central Terminal in New York City from 1950 to 1964. Pete's granddaughters, Jane Maltifano and Laura Sylvester, led the, lead the Harcourt M. and Virginia W. Sylvester Foundation, and their own daughters serve on the foundation as well. While the family primarily resides in Florida, their deep ties to Rochester and love of Pete Potter's legacy inspired the gift that made this Colorama reproduction possible for the enjoyment of our Eastman Museum community. We thank them for their generosity and commitment to the George Eastman Museum. We're excited to have Steve Kelly join us today to share about his experiences working on the Colorama campaign as well as some of the other work he's done in the studio and around the world for Kodak's print advertising, television, and corporate campaigns. Steve was a photographer for the company from 1974 to 2012. That was 38 years, if you're trying to do the math. He has won numerous awards for his photography, including several Addies and a Telly. And a do, uh, I'm sorry, and the telly was for the documentary that he did on uh, Colorama. And he has done location work in 25 different countries and has over 120,000 images in Kodak's digital image library. Steve attended Rochester Institute of Technology where he received a degree in photography and graphic design. And before joining Kodak, he was an advertising art director. In 2012, I, I think this was maybe after you retired, Steve uh, began uh, volunteering here at the Eastman Museum and started working on the restoration of Eastman's Aeolian pipe organ. Steve joined what at the time was a team of six volunteers that came to the museum every Monday to work on the pipe organ, not only fixing specific problems to the organ, to so the organ sounded like it should, but also assisting with a major restoration of the North Organ. Steve has been an invaluable member of this team for many years and was a featured organist at many of the regular Sunday music concerts in the mansion. I'm sure some of you have attended those. 
so I just want to actually say, if we can say a quick thank you to Steve for uh, the generosity and really, really giving so much back to his community uh, through his volunteer work here. Uh, it's, it's, it's immensely appreciated and, and it's immensely important to us here at the museum. Um, so I think that does it with my notes. I did want to thank you all uh, I, for, um, for being here and, and for also, I, I, you know, uh, the, I know that we're still kind of working through COVID related pr protocols and that's kind of changing everywhere right now. Thank you all for sticking with us through our protocols and wearing your masks throughout the presentation. Uh, when you leave the theater and you're back in the museum, if you're walking around, you do not need to wear your masks out in the museum. We just ask that you do it in here because we're all seated within such cl close proximity to one another. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Steve Kelly. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate this is This is amazing. I'm looking out on all these faces. A lot of you I know, a lot of you I worked with. That This is really a, a great opportunity. So I want to start by telling you that it's not just the Coderama we're going to talk about, although we'll spend a good deal of time about it. But a lot of you may not know that what other things Kodak photographers did. We did everything. So you're going to get a really good feeling for what it was like to be a staff photographer, actually a chief photographer at Kodak. And we'll have time for questions afterwards. And I'm glad we have the plexiglass, because I know some of you brought tomatoes. so. We should be in good shape. Started at a pretty early age. Um, this is uh, me with a Kodak camera, of course, photographing my sister Mary and uh, doing a close-up portrait, which uh, I always tell people, if you're going to do a portrait, get in close. Very important. And then this happened. I joined the staff of photographic illustrations at Eastman Kodak in 1974. Uh, a move that basically changed my life, I'll be very honest with you. Uh, I'm the guy with the assistant in my lap in the foreground. And <laughs> it, was, it was a great place to work. It was a staff of very talented people. I considered myself extremely lucky for that opportunity. There's a gentleman here tonight, his name is Dick Faust. And without Dick Faust, I wouldn't be sitting there, nor would I be standing here, by the way. I worked for Dick as an assistant as I got out of RIT. And I probably learned more about photography from Dick in about the first month than I learned in all four years at RIT. I'll be very honest with you about that. But he had some connections with Kodak and he called me one day and he said, I think they're looking for another shooter. Maybe you should drag your book over there. And I did. So that, that's, that was a great opportunity. Now, it, it was a dream job, absolutely a dream job. If you're a photographer, why not work for Kodak? There was one caveat, though, in that job. The important thing was you got to come back with a picture. They would buy any piece of camera equipment, any piece of lighting equipment you could have dreamed of, but you had to come back with the picture. That was the deal. And it was a great deal. This is a little later staff picture. Uh, these are six of the photographic illustrators. We kind of split the staff. There were photographers, and then there were photographic illustrators. And this group of people, we were the illustrators. Uh, we've got some people that are with us and not with us, but uh, just to work on that in that staff was, was just absolutely amazing. Some of you recognize everyone in here, I'm sure. I had a business card. That was my business card. The first business card I had was just type. Kodak had this tradition of putting a portrait on your business card. And I hated that. I thought that was dumb. So I ended up doing my own kind of version of the Kodak business card. This business card was not just a business card. It was a magic key. It was a key to the rest of the world. If you carried this around and you proved you were from Kodak, it opened doors you just can't imagine, oh, opportunities you can't imagine. It was not Steve Kelly. It was Steve Kelly from Kodak. That made a big difference. Huge difference. Yeah. 
And we're here to talk about Taj Mahal, color amp on number 531. And I'm, I'm so grateful this, for this museum to, for selecting that picture. Uh, it's, I think it's the largest color picture they've ever shown here. And we used to say back at Kodak, if you can't make it good, make it big and in color. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> it, was, it was quite an honor. And now I'm standing in, with a Linhoff Technorama camera. This is not the exact one, but this is the same model camera I would have used to take that picture. And when I started, it was 1974, they were well halfway through the Colorama run. They never started taking Coloramas with a camera like that. They took Coloramas with a camera like that. That's an 8 by 20 inch Deerdorf, meaning the film, the negative, is 8 inches tall by 20 inches wide. That is one big piece of film. But they needed that because early versions of Ectocolor film weren't particularly good. It was quite unsharp, actually. So to get the 60-foot enlargement, they had to start with a really big negative. So they were discussing when they got the assignment to do the first coloramas, how are we going to do this? And one of the guys raised his hand and said, I know there's a banquet camera that Deerdorf makes. And it, it uses a really big chunk of film. So they got a couple of them from Deerdorf in Chicago, and they did some tests, and that proved to be just enough, just enough image, beginning image, to make the coloramas with. And they used to kid me constantly about, you know, what do you know about shooting a colorama? Here's how you really shoot a colorama. This is Lee Howick, probably at Machu Picchu on an assignment in South America, and you can see he's got the ground glass marked out to the 3.3 to 1 aspect ratio, which is what the colorama images were. So yeah, I guess maybe to be a real colorama photographer, you had to, this was more like a motorhome than a camera, actually. <laughs> so the next slide is actually video, and it's a short video clip from a documentary that Mike Champlin and I produced several years ago about the colorama. And I wanted to show all of you this because there may be a bunch of people in the audience that don't even know where the colorama was shown, the context that it was shown in. So I'll show that next. It's got audio on it. Yes, it was impressive, without a doubt. And so was Grand Central, by the way. That is, I'm, I'm sure most of you have been there, that is a very, very impressive site. Uh, probably why Kodak chose it, plus you had a million people going through there every day. So uh, the next bit of video is just, again, a short clip from the documentary to, to kind of give you an idea how they made these. How did Kodak actually make one of these? A lot of people think it was one picture. One enlargement, 60 feet across. That's not true. It was several enlargements, vertical strips that were then glued together to make the 18 by 60 foot colorama. It was all done at Kodak Park. It was all invented by Kodak. The, the enlargers, the easels, the, all of the equipment, the seaming tape that they had to come up with a special tape that would melt the film as it was taped across so that the seams would never ever come apart. Pretty amazing, and they did it in a relatively short amount of time. They didn't have a lot of time to figure it out. So we'll look at that, and I'll talk over it. There's no sound on it. Uh, 
the transparencies were made at uh, Building 65 at Kodak Park, which actually no longer exists. This is the dark room, if you can call it that. Look at the size of that negative. That's an 8 by 20 inch negative. Going into the special and larger, they're setting the timer. Some of these exposures could be five or six minutes long. That's the easel. That's where the film would actually be, across, literally across the room. Here they're doing a quality check just to make sure the color's right before they actually spend $30,000 to make the print. Another shot of the enlarger. Again, built at Kodak, it does kind of look more like a Sherman tank than an enlarger. All pre-focused. Here, now this was taken in the light. This operation would actually happen in darkness, total darkness. Pull the film out and get it onto the easel. Here's what the final process strips would look like. They'd put them on a light table so they could line them up and line, like wallpaper, line up the seams. They're actually now taping the seam together. Probably had a GoPro there on the... Here's uh, putting grommets. It was, became a giant trampoline when they were done with it so they could stretch it taut in Grand Central Station. Here we are in Grand Central Station. They're hanging it. They would hang it, tip the roll up, and then roll it out over this immense light box. This is actually back at the swimming pool, as we called it, at Kodak office, where they would check it. There's another uh, scene coming up. Here's another one being looked at. That was a final inspection point for the Colorama. They were not processed in a swimming pool. They, were, you know, they used the pool because it was an available space. Here we are back in New York. That, that core, that aluminum core, weighed quite a bit. And they would ship them back and forth to New York on an aluminum core. This was handled by a company called Spectorama in New York all union labor to hang these things. And there it is in Grand, and the, it's on the east balcony of Grand Central Station. It was a fixture from, as Nick said, from 1950 to 1990. Now we're up to this one. This is the one we're here to talk about. This was a picture I took on the end of a pretty grueling three-week trip in India. And a lot of our international trips weren't just to get coloramas. They were usually arranged by the marketing department. Maybe they were selling a bunch of copiers to the Indian government. Maybe they wanted to sell more Kodak film in India. So they would often use Kodak photographers as something they could sweeten the deal with. You know, by the way, we could send one of our photographers to your country and take pictures for your tourism bureau. Anything you want, they'll photograph for you. And this was that type of a trip. It was grueling, I say, because my itinerary was temples and historical sites and not particularly interesting. I did have the Colorama camera with me, of course, and I always carried the viewfinder separately so I could just see maybe, maybe there's something here. And through those three weeks, I did a few. I did a few Coloramas, none of which I'm going to show you. But... Um, you know, I was a little bit disheartened on that trip because I was getting down to the literally the last two days. And I really didn't have much. I had taken care of my clients in India. They were all happy. But I still hadn't really gotten a picture. So we got to Agra the second to the last day of the trip in the late afternoon. And we met this guy with a boat on the Taj Mahal side of the river. And we paid him some money and said, could you bring us across? We'd like to take a look from the other side. And he did, and it was cloudy, not particularly nice, but the river was full of water, which it always isn't. It's a, very rare for that river to have water in it. So that was all good. So I took a look and I said, yeah, maybe. So why don't we meet at before dawn? We'll meet before dawn on the other side. They paid him some money so he would spend the night in that temple, there's a temple behind him, and meet us, and he did. And we showed up. It was dark. It wasn't pitch dark. It was just beginning to get light. He brought us across, and things started to look pretty good at that point. You know, as a photographer, that maybe, maybe. Sunrises are tough to predict because there's nothing there. Sunsets are easy. You can see them develop. Sunrises, you can't. It's just, okay, here it comes. So I set up the camera. I put the lens within inches of the water. That's so that you get a nice deep reflection set it up, leveled it, 
use, actually used the ground glass on the camera, which I would rarely use on the Technorama, but I did. And I waited, and the sun came up, and things started to look pretty good. That's what I saw. Those are the first few frames I shot. And I was feeling pretty good. The light was good. The mist was still on the water. OK, got that. I mean, when you get there as a photographer, and you see good light and mist on the water, you don't wait and say, what else? You just start shooting. You go on automatic. F-stop, shutter speeds, focus, that's all like breathing. It's automatic. So I got those. I shot two rolls, which is only about eight frames, because that camera shoots a wide frame. And it still was good. So I'm looking at it going, OK, now how can you make this better? Well, all the time I was shooting this, excuse me, the boat guy's right next to me. He's literally shoulder to shoulder with me watching me work. And a light went off, and I asked my interpreters, have him put the boat in the water. Get the boat in the water. Quick, quick, put it in the water. And he took it out dutifully. So it went from having a pretty picture to a colorama. We have a foreground now. Huge difference. That night I was on a flight back to New York, very last day of the trip. Sometimes your luck is with you. <laughs> Sometimes, not always. Now, I did other coloramas. I did other coloramas before this one. These were not specialized assignments. These were assignments pretty much like any other assignment. They would pick you, or someone else would pick you, and, and you would do it. Uh, a couple of years before India, I found myself in Holland. The Dutch government had contacted Kodak and said, is it possible for you to do a colorama? Colorama, by that point, had become almost a trademark. It was something that people knew about it all over the world. So they knew that there was this venue in New York that Kodak put up this giant print. So I drew that assignment, and I spent two weeks traveling around Holland, beautiful country. Herma, you come from a very nice country. And we shot everything. We shot a lot of tulips. i would never seen this many tulips in my life. They grow them like we grow corn by the acre. And one day, one of our days, we came upon this field, and it was just about the right look. It had the farm in the background. So now we got to go find the farmer. And we drove to this house, which is way back there. And my assistant, Cherry, spoke perfect Dutch, so we talked to him. And he was thrilled. He was very happy. He was, like, excited. So we brought him back out into the field and made this picture. And I made a ton of other ones. That, that trip, I mean, I, I, this was one of the first international trips I did for Kodak. So I was very concerned that I wasn't up to snuff. I made sure that I brought back lots of, I have tons of windmills, you name it, I've got them. But this one stood out just because of the fact that the, the bulb growers really wanted us to feature tulips. And we didn't just shoot coloramas. We shot Kodachromes. Here's the farmer, close up Kodachrome. Great guy. He got dressed up for this. This is not what he normally wears in the field. Um, didn't speak much English. I spoke a little German, so, you know, whatever. Here's some uh, bulb workers in a different field tending the fields. What they do is as the bulbs come up, they can see which bulbs are where, and they have to kind of sort them. So if you've got a yellow tulip in a red field, you want to sort that out, because once the bulbs are harvested, you can't tell the difference. That's my assistant, Cherry. I would, as, as we did, John and I did on many of our trips, we would always make sure we had a good-looking helper, because <laughs> You just don't know when you're, not, when you're going to need a good face in a picture. And I put Cherry in all kinds of pictures. And she's kind of mimicking what the farmers would do. A year later, I find myself in Southeast Asia on a trip through Thailand, Singapore, and Malaysia. This was arranged, again, as part of a, a deal to sell Kodak products in those countries. This was shot in Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai is north of Bangkok, up near Burma. It's up in the mountains. And I did a ton of coloramas in, in Thailand. Now, while I was shooting this, m my tulip colorama was actually being put up at Grand Central. And had I been in New York, 
I would have met the Queen of Holland because they brought the Queen to Grand Central to see the Tulip Colorama. Unfortunately, I missed out. Never got to meet the Queen. So I was busy doing this. And we would often get some ideas about pictures we were going to take because we would do research on the different countries we were going to. And I knew this could be a possible subject, so we made the trip up to Chiang Mai from Bangkok and took the picture. That's a much younger Steve Kelly. I don't know who did his wardrobe. I have no idea. <laughs> That's one of the Kodak Thailand advertising people that accompanied me along the trip. And we styled it. I mean, we moved umbrellas around. 3.3 to 1 is a tough format. It's, you end up really having to work pretty hard to fill it. But in this case, I think it worked out OK. Another uh, kind of other shot I did on that trip, just temples and people, that kind of stuff. Fascinating stuff. This was an alternate. This was one of the alternates from that Southeast Asian trip. And I really liked this one. I was, we, we would often lobby for our pictures, which ones would go up, which ones wouldn't. And I put my bid in on this one. It didn't get past the committee, so to speak. But I felt this was even more interesting than umbrella painting. But you know, of course, Kodak is all about color. So that's how the, um, this, is, this is the floating market north of Bangkok. The, the interesting thing about the Colorama, it would transport someone from Grand Central Station to somewhere else in the world. That was a big appeal of that picture. Here's, here's a commuter coming through there at 7 o'clock or whatever, and now they're not there anymore. Now they're in Thailand, or now they're in India. This was 1988. This is the Calgary opening ceremonies uh, in Calgary, Canada. And I shared this assignment with Bill Kafer, another colleague at Kodak. We often would do that, especially if we thought we could maybe get two angles at once and perhaps get a little better yield. So we went there. Unfortunately, when you do these opening ceremony pictures, you don't see any Olympics. We were, once that opening ceremony was over, I was on a plane back to Rochester because I had to get the film back there. Remember, we're still shooting film now. And what Kodak did, they tried to get the, they wanted to make sure they would get the Colorama into Grand Central Station while the Olympics were still going on. So it was a real all hands on deck effort. So we landed back in Rochester late that night, gave the film over to the lab. I slept on a couch in the studio. I don't know where Bill slept, but we got some sleep. The technicians woke us up and said, we've got proofs, so let's look. And this is the one that actually got selected. They went immediately went to Kodak Park, and in about uh, three days, it was up in Grand Central Station. That, that was a tough thing to do, big deal. Very expensive, by the way, to pull that off. There we go. Some of you know where this is, this is San Francisco. These are the painted ladies at Elmore Square. Uh, this was an interesting trip. I was asked to go out to California, come back with a picture that says California. That's a, that's a pretty wide open assignment, I would say. So I spent some time in San Francisco. Uh, yes, I did photograph the Golden Gate Bridge. I would have been insane not to. That's, that's a colorama, right? This is the one they chose, which I like. It's, it's not a typical shot. This was actually shot on Kodachrome. At that time, we were using Kodachrome as the original film for Coloramas. I had to knock on every one of those doors and make a deal with the owner to leave his porch light or her porch light on and leave some of the room lights on so I would get that effect. Also during that same trip, I had another assignment on top of California. Disneyland was celebrating or soon to celebrate their 30th anniversary. So they asked Kodak, could you do a Colorama? And of course Kodak said yes. Kodak had a very tight relationship with Disney. Disney is a film studio. They buy a lot of film. So I had pre-scouted it the day before, and we all, the Disney folks, agreed this is a good spot. I said, I need as many characters as you can round up, and here's what I want to do. So I got there, but the problem was these characters never pose like this together. This is very unusual. They're usually separated and walking around through the theme park. 
So it took a while to assemble them. And I'm looking at the sun. It's late in the afternoon going, uh-oh, it's getting darker. Well, by the time they got there, it was really getting darker. And again, I'm shooting film. I had no lighting equipment. It's just available light. So there they are. And the other little obstacle was every visitor at that park wanted my picture. <laughs> they saw this, and they freaked out because this doesn't actually happen. So I had to be good cop as best I could. Sometimes I wasn't so polite. And the characters had been briefed that pay attention to that guy. He's the guy that you need to pose for. And they were great. They, every frame was a different pose. I mean, these are actors. They, they know how to animate. They know how to look good. So I shot it, thinking, well, maybe, you know, you know, you guys are all, a lot of you are photographers. You have that feeling that, yeah, maybe. It's, it's going to be a little, a little underexposed, but maybe. So I got back to Rochester. The technicians looked at the negative and said, OK, Kelly, we'll save your ass again. And they put a mask, a, a contrast, uh, actually a shadow mask, which is another piece of film sandwiched with my original negative, allowing them to print this, and nobody, no one would be the wiser that it was underexposed. OK, you can change now. There we go. This was an interesting assignment, especially for me. This is the Metropolitan Opera at Lincoln Center, and they contacted Kodak and said, we'd love to showcase the Met at the Grand Central. So the assignment fell to me. Now, I have a little bit of history with that opera. My uncle, John Crane, sang as a tenor for City Center Opera and the Metropolitan Opera. And as a kid, we would hear Mary's here, and Mary would remember that Uncle John would come and he'd rehearse at home. Even if he was in our hometown, he would still have to rehearse. His voice was so loud, we would run out of the room screaming. <laughs> was great, amazing musician. I think maybe the fact that I play the organ here, that might have come from Uncle John. So the, the technical challenge here is this never happens. The house lights during a performance are never on. It's dark. It's just like we are here. The stage is illuminated, but not the house. So I had to photograph the performance at a dress rehearsal. That stage shot had to be taken before the house shot. And then I had to ask the Met, can you leave the house lights on longer than you normally do to give me a chance to get the image of the house? And they first said, no, absolutely not. You know, the Met's over 100 years old. We don't do that. That's where that business card came in handy. <laughs> so they agreed. And they left them on for five, and I mean five minutes precisely longer. Because we had to wait for the patrons to get back into their seats so it would look like a full house. Got back to the spot we had shot the rehearsal shot at, the exact same seat. Fortunately, the seats are numbered. So we were in the exact same spot. The gongs went off. The people came out from the lobby back in. I got my exposures, I was done, lights went out, and the opera started. And I stayed for the opera because if any of you are opera buffs, you know that's the place to watch an opera. That was Puccini's turn dot, by the way. Sometimes they're not that easy. This is a local, this is local, this is Rush, New York. We wanted to do a winter colorama. So late one winter, we decided let's get it before the snow goes away. The interesting part of this is that the house, those aren't just the house lighting. Those are strobes. There's a strobe in every room of that house plus one in the garage. So that when I would fire my camera shutter, all those strobes would go off simultaneously. And I'm standing right at the road to get the angle I needed. And there's cars behind me going on the road. Every time we'd fire the strobes, they would stop <laughs> thinking that the house was, you know, poltergeist. They had no idea what was going on there. It's, it's interesting sometimes what you do and you don't realize other people will look at it as abnormal. This was shot for a Halloween colorama. We had gotten wind of a, a guy in New York who carved pumpkins. He was really good at it. And we contacted him and explained to him we'd like to do a picture with your pumpkins. So I picked him up at the airport and I knew who it was because he had a sack full of pumpkins. He brought his own pumpkins with him. <laughs> 
And he showed us a bunch of wood carvings that he used as reference when he does these carvings. So we sat down in the conference room and picked out, we, we picked out, he had some pretty scary ones, but we picked out more child-friendly ones, I should say. He spent the entire night in the studio, in our studio, carving those pumpkins. It takes forever. We're talking about X-Acto blades and little tweezers, and I mean, he was, he was absolutely amazing. So that morning, the next morning, the pumpkins are done. I had an assistant put a strobe light in every one of the pumpkins, and we had our two curious models hired. So we put the lid on the first pumpkin, and I said, okay, when I say so, open the lid and look in the pumpkin. Of course, the moment they did that, I would fire the strobes. And they thought it was fun. They had a great time with it because they were kind of controlling the whole thing. Unfortunately, their parents called about a week later and said their sight is just coming back now. But <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, that's what it looked like in Grand Central. Someone else shot that and sent it to me. Uh, talk about a, a, a Ghostbusters background for a Halloween colorama. That's pretty cool. This was an, an assignment I got. Kodak uh, rented their space in Grand Central Station, and they rented it from the Metropolitan Transit Authority, who they own Grand Central. They also own the subway, they own the commuter lines, big operation. And we had a deal with them. We had to make one colorama a year that showcased some part of their business. The year I got it, it was the subway. So I spent an entire day one summer with a whole bunch of advertising suits and a car, and we drove all over New York going into different subway stations and looking at their maintenance facilities. They had a whole laundry list of things they thought would make a good picture, none of which would make a good picture. <laughs> so at the end of the day, we're back in their office, and we're talking, and they said, what do you think? And I said, I think we're in trouble. I haven't seen anything I like yet. And I'm sure if it hadn't had that Steve Kelly by Kodak thing, I would have been thrown out, but I didn't. Fortunately, the head of track maintenance was in that meeting. And he's telling me what you want. What are you looking for? And I said, I need a picture that shows the subway not underground, but shows it in context with New York. It, it's New York. And he said, I know the spot. No problem. Let's go. So we all hopped back into the cars and drove over to Queens. And he had this spot, and there was no train there. There was just the elevated track. And he said, what do you think? And I said, that's it. That's what we need. I needed to get up about another 20 feet, but not a problem. He said, I'm track maintenance. I'll build you a, a scaffold, <laughs> which they did. So that next morning, scaffold's done. I'm out there, got my camera up on top of this. A couple of, of subway people have a radio that I can communicate with the train. The train just magically appears from under the East River, and there it is. And I'm now talking. I have the best Lionel train set in all the world. <laughs> and I can move the train by inches, literally by inches, just by asking forward or backward. And we start shooting. And the light was OK, but it, I knew it was going to get better. But the train couldn't stay there, because that train wasn't really a real train. It was a photo train. The real train had to get on that track to get to its destination, which was out in Flushing. And this was the time of the US Open, so there were extra trains on that line. So the engineer would say, oh, got to go. And he'd back up and then just disappear. And the regular train would go by. And about 10 minutes later, the photo train would reappear. And after a few tries, we got it. We got the picture. I used a wedge filter for all you photographers. This wasn't that serendipitous. We did not get that salmon color sky over the Manhattan. You have to fool around a bit. This was all before Photoshop. This had to be done in camera in one shot. So we got it. So if, as I'm packing stuff up, I look down from the scaffolding, and there's 20 or 30 photographers, amateur photographers, with their tripods, and they're shooting away. They had shot the whole thing. And I asked the, the subway folks, I said, what's going on? He said, well, this is a big deal for them. This train never, ever is seen on those tracks. For them, it's the shot of a lifetime. I had no idea. I don't even know how they found out it was going to be there. I have no clue. Never asked. Uh, I got a shot here of it. That's, there we go. That's the full frame. We shot, I shot this with a 6x7 Pentax. That's the actual full frame shot, and then, of course, Within there is the colorama.
we did commercial color. We did one commercial colorama every year featuring Kodak products, and it usually hung sometime in November. And then after that, they would hang a traditional colorama. This was shot in our studio in Rochester. And a couple of the people are actually co-workers and you know, whoever we could find. I, there's no discussion about the colorama without talking about the Kodorama. Late in the late 1980s, Kodak was informed that they could no longer use Grand Central to show their coloramas. There was a, a major renovation of Grand Central Station that was about to begin, and they decided that they just didn't want that advertising display anymore there. So they gave us a heads up, and the advertising people at Kodak had to figure out, do you still want to be in New York with some sort of a visual presence? And they decided they did. So they started looking around, and they came up with a venue that the Marriott company was just making, building, or finishing, I should say, a new hotel in Times Square, the Marriott Marquis. So they made some negotiations, and they paid some money and built a light box, and that's how the, col the Coderama started. This was actually the very first Coderama. It was, it was put up in 1985. Now, the Colorama is still running. It, they ran together for five years. This one, uh, I got the assignment to do the very first one. Very interesting story here. We hired two models, uh, an adult female from New York, and then we had a, had a kid that we found in Rochester. Somebody actually made a recommendation, why don't you use this girl? She turned out to be George Bush's granddaughter. One of, I have no idea what the connection. I just basically said, yeah, fine, she's cute, okay. Well, George Bush's granddaughter was cute, but when we put her in the frame, she started screaming. And you know, you've all been there, right? Especially photographers that are here. It's over. When that happens, it's over. You might as well just fold up the camera and leave. Well, I made a frantic call to home, and I said, you gotta get Gretchen down here, and you gotta get her down here fast. That's my daughter, Gretchen. And Gretchen saved the picture. She didn't cry at all. She was, she knew who, where daddy was, right? <laughs> yeah, that was fun to do. That, that Kodorama is 30 by 50 feet. This was another one. This one actually was, a lot of the Kodoramas were pickups on advertising shots we'd already done. Unlike the Colorama, they weren't in that very unique 3.3 to 1 format. So almost anything could be a Kodorama in terms of aspect ratio. This was a picture I did for a series of billboards in Atlanta ahead of the 1996 Olympics. I did it with uh, Steve Shear, who might be here today. He was the art director. He came up with a whole bunch of ideas. And we did kids doing Olympic sports. That was the whole theme here. Now there's a cat trainer right behind the wall, making sure the cat doesn't leave. And the trick there is the girl was fine. The trick was to get the cat to look up at her. This was a purpose shot for the Kodorama. Uh, it, I forget the year, but there was an anniversary celebration, obviously, for Kodak making motion picture film for 100 years. I'm thinking it's around 19, 1989, something like that. That's the Hollywood Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Looks like an easy picture, but not so easy because you got to stop traffic on Hollywood Boulevard. There's, there's some issues there. This one, uh, John will recognize this picture instantly. This was a pickup from the launch of Ektar Film, which was an extremely sharp color negative film that Kodak came out with. And John and I, John Buck and I, were given the assignment to come up with a whole bunch of different pictures taken by different camera manufacturers' cameras with Ektar Film. And his, his idea was to do a thematic set of pictures with circles as being the theme. So this one was shot in our studio, had someone paint a circle on this little girl's face. This, the interesting thing here, this was shot, the, the camera that was featured in this particular shot was a Leica. Some of you know what Leica cameras are, they're a German camera. And like it, all the camera manufacturers sent us cameras. We didn't have all these cameras at the studio. We had some of them, but not all of them. So Leica sent us a Leica with a lens, and they said, try this one. Well, this was the absolute sharpest lens I ever used in my entire life. I mean, you can even on this screen, you can see the detail that it resolves. This is 35 millimeter. This is an inch by inch and a half negative. No more eight by 20 inch negatives. That's an inch by inch and a half negative. 
So we thought, that's a pretty nice lens. Maybe we'd like to buy it. And we contacted Leica and said, can we buy this one? And they said, absolutely not. It's not for sale. <laughs> it, was, it was literally a hand-picked lens that they used for internal testing. And no, you can buy another one, but you can't have that one. And the Colorama still lives on to today, and it lived on through most of my career, not in Grand Central Station. It ended in Grand Central Station in 1990. But the format never went away. Never went away. This is an international poster program shot that we did. I think, John, and John, did you work on You did this one, right? That was John's idea. And we shot that in the studio in Rochester on 8x10 film. Not an easy picture if you know anything about an 8x10 camera. To get that close to something with that camera is, is tricky. We had a makeup artist come in, do the makeup. The problem with the makeup was every time the model would exhale, if she exhaled through her lips, these little flecks of gold would just go off and stick into the red on her skin. It was a problem issue. Again, we're not digital here yet. Not at all. This is all on film. Now, that would have been an interesting colorama for Grand Central Station. Those lips would have been about 40 feet across, so that, that would have been pretty cool. And it lived on even more. This is another international poster that we did. We set this shot up. In fact, the girl, the second girl on the left is my daughter, Megan. You got to have kids if you want to be a Kodak photographer. And this, this was shot actually in Kodak office right on State Street. There's a little auditorium there that looks a lot like a grammar school auditorium. It's the quintessential little auditorium. So we shot it there. You can kind of get a little behind the scenes look into how we would light something like that, how we would set it up. And that's the, that's the final product. Now I did finally get to the Golden Gate with a Colorama. This was for an, a print ad. This was for a print ad for a Kodak single-use camera that actually shot in the wide format. Come on, let's go. There we go. There's the ad. That was part of a TV shoot, and I'll show you some television stuff that I worked on as well. We would, because of money and expenses, of course, we would often bundle all these trips and all these shoots. If I was doing a TV commercial, I was also doing print ads at the same time, or I might be doing something else. Once you're there, it's like, oh, you're going to be in California or you're going to be wherever. Can you do this, too, while you're there? This is also California. This was years later. We were doing, this is digital. This is a digital image. We were doing shots to put on the back of digital cameras. And this was part of a Zoom demo showing that, you know, if you buy our digital camera with a 50x Zoom, you can get really close to the boat, all of that stuff. And I thought, maybe that would make a good colorama, too. So I cropped it. And yeah, it probably would have made a good colorama. This is actually John Buck and I, again, working in Oregon, doing digital photography for a whole lifestyle series. And the demo here was fast action, sports mode, how, how the camera performed in that situation. But again, it actually would have made a really nice colorama. And believe it or not, there's more. Um, I, was, I was hired at Kodak primarily to do advertising photography. I had a background at an agency. I had a background working for probably the best advertising photographer in the city. So I had a pretty good portfolio at that time. And they needed someone to work with advertising agencies and keep them coming back to the Kodak studio and comfortable with the Kodak studio. So I did a ton. My, that was really my bread and butter work for a ton of my career, was working with Rumble Hoyt, working with uh, J. Walter Thompson, working with any agency you can imagine who worked with Kodak. I worked with them as the photographer. I actually got the back cover of Life magazine once. So to do that, that's, that's a multi-shot deal there. I had to do the camera as a product shot. I had to do the picture with the camera that the person is holding. And then I have to get a model in the studio and take the picture of the person holding the camera, holding the picture that the camera took. So it's, it takes a little bit of time. It's not a quick, quick thing.
trade ads, shot a ton of trade ads. Whoops, I'm sorry. Let me see if I'll go back. Yeah, it goes back. Uh, this was in American Cinematographer. Kodak started selling tape, videotape. So this was done in camera. Again, we're, this one is not digital. This is pre-digital. Simply done by moving the lens across the film plane and taking exposure on top of another exposure on top of another exposure and making it happen. Uh, Dave Buck is here. David Buck was the art director on this. We just, I just spoke with him. I wanted to get my story straight. Uh, we, we, he had a sketch of this or a, a, a marker drawing of his idea. And he said, okay, how are you going to do it? So we figured out we could put light bulbs on the back of a golf cart. And we could go up to Duran Eastman Golf Course, find kind of the background that we liked, and then drive the golf cart through the, through the course with the shutter open so that the lights would paint themselves onto the film as the golf cart was disappearing into the horizon. And I couldn't remember if David drove it or if someone else, he, he tells me an assistant drove it, which I can believe that. I had a radio, you know, because the assistant had to do it predictably time after time over and over again until we were happy that we got it. You don't need Photoshop in every case. <laughs> I guess that's the illustration there. A lot of studio still lifes, tons of studio still lifes. We had celebrities many times in Doris Kodak products. We had Michael Landon, we had Dick Van Dyke, we actually even had Bill Cosby. And my job again is a multi-level job. I have to get a picture of Michael, I gotta get a product shot of the camera, and then I actually have to create that effect behind the headline. I did that in camera as well. That's actually me. <laughs> I had to get myself in one ad at some point in 38 years. NASCAR, big deal. Fun, really fun. Um, Scott, you've worked with me on NASCAR. Carlos, you worked with me on NASCAR. <laughs> These, these cars were built by a car builder in Abingdon, Virginia. So every year we would have a trip to Abingdon to do a poster for that particular year. This one, though, was done in Daytona Beach because Sterling Marlin, the driver, had won Daytona Beach twice in a row, and they thought he might win it a third time. So they said, let's do it, let's do it in Daytona Beach because he's going to be there anyway. This was literally, that's not mylar under the car. That's actually wet sand. And then in the background, that's spinnaker cloth or sailcloth that's stretched across two mambo light stands. And we have a wind machine moving that cloth to give it that little bit of life to it during the picture. And then Sterling's lit with strobes, the car's lit with strobes. Interesting shot. Now, Sterling is bald, completely bald. His, his dad, Cuckoo Marlin, is also bald. So he wears a toupee, and we've got a wind machine. Could, could, could be a problem. So I talked to him about it. I said, you know, the guy in the wind machine, you may occasionally feel some, he, ah, don't worry about it. I got, this is good glue. And it stayed. I think he used an extra amount because he got nailed, and that thing just never, one hair, not one hair on that thing ever moved. A lot of fun to do. Now, as we're shooting, there's a thing called tide when you're on the shoreline. Well, the tide's coming in. So I, would, I always go longer than I say, you know, it's about an hour. Well, hour goes by, now it's an hour and a half. So the show car driver came over to me and he said, you know, you got about another minute. Because once that thing is not submerged but gets too much water, we're never going to get it out of here. It will be in Bermuda by tomorrow. So, so I had to wrap it and done. and A lot of fun. This is another shoot. I think the following year we took the car to New York. Uh, in a studio in New York that had this light. This light is 40 feet across. You don't bring the light to the car, you bring the car to the light. And we photographed it in this studio in New York City. That's the resulting picture, again, with a lot of digital manipulation and Sterling's back. Now, he, when we're in the studio, he's like, can I drive this? And I said, I, that's up to you. So he took it out of the studio. The studio was at ground level and drove it around the block. I don't know if you've ever heard one of these NASCAR cars. They, are in, they have no mufflers. They're incredibly loud. 
people were opening windows, running out of their offices, <laughs> no, no license plates or anything like that. He, he was that kind of a person. He's like, well, let's give it a try. Come on, change, you can do it. There we go. Olympic swimmer. A brochure for a radiography film. Yes, we did shoot black and white film occasionally at Kodak. These are all agency directed projects. This was for um, customer uh, service shot in our studio and on our cyclorama at, at Kodak office. Product photography, that's a big deal. Kodak makes all kinds of products, big and small. Now this might look simple. Any of you photographers here know it is not simple. You have a whole bunch of different surfaces you have to deal with. You've got dark leather, shiny chrome, glass, you name it, it's there. Very hard to get in one image. This was done when we were shooting digitally. So what we would do is shoot the same picture over and over again, lighting for different parts of the camera, customizing the lighting for the lens, customizing it for the leather, whatever. And then in Photoshop, we would assemble it as one image. And that really made our product photography virtually perfect. You could have anything you wanted. Another product shot. What's interesting here is all these digital cameras had screens on the back. So we had to come up with pictures for the screens as well. That was something we didn't do before. Kodak cameras before that were film cameras, didn't have a screen on the back. So that opened up a whole category of photography that we called lifestyle photography that we had to feed. They had a voracious appetite for photos. So it, our business quadrupled be, be just because of that need. Again, product photography, it's all, every, every shadow, every highlight is a decision. Even though that thing's only about five inches tall, it's just the same as lighting the NASCAR car. Everything has to be taken into consideration. Some of the products are a bit bigger. That's like about 12 Maytag washing machines bolted together. That's a, that's a digital printing press. And that's, that's done with a combination of lighting and a combination of digital magic. Not easy to do. This is an all-day project, just to give you an idea of how long it takes to do this. This is kind of nostalgic for me, not because it's an old camera, but that's a piece of sheet film. That's a piece of 4 by 5 sheet film, something I haven't seen in quite some time. We, we pretty much stopped shooting film by the late 90s. Everything we were doing was now digital. But it's nostalgic for me because I shot so much of it. I shot probably thousands, if not tens of thousands, of sheets of Kodak film. And I, I think I told John the other day, I never had one piece of that film in 38 years that had a defect on it. Not one. That's pretty amazing, I think. It really is. Another international poster program shot. This is one of those billboards for Atlanta, one of the other ones. And we had a model, and we had a, a trained dog. And I thought I was going to have trouble with the dog. The dog was perfect. Every time I'd cue it, OK, let's go. He would jump over the hedge, almost identical in every time. The girl, on the other hand, not so much. And I, she was struggling, so I went over and I said, honey, it's no big deal. Just follow the dog. <laughs> That's the context of that. Kodorama that was first used. These were billboards. They were shown all over Atlanta at the Atlanta airport. Come on. You can change it. I hope this isn't glitching here. I'm sorry for the delay here. Nicole, do you, yeah, there you go. I'll go back. Going back seems to be as hard as going forward. There we go. Okay, this is so far so good, right? Well, that concludes our show today. <laughs> there we go. Group shots, we all hated them. But this one is a little different. I think I may hold the record for the biggest group shot ever taken at Kodak. About 2,500 people. 
they, they decided, J. Walter Thompson, their New York agency, had an ad campaign and they wanted people, Kodak people, to talk about quality. So we tried to figure out how we're going to do it. And we thought, well, let's go to one of the plants. Let's shoot it at noon. And let's feed everybody lunch. And then take a picture of them in the parking lot, which is exactly what we did. And I needed to be up high to get the viewpoint I wanted. That's my trusty 8x10 there. And they gave me a PA system so I could talk to everyone, kind of corral them roughly into the, we had it marked out on the parking lot where the actual live frame was. But because it was a bleed image, we needed extra people. I never told those extra people they wouldn't be in the picture. But. <laughs> so I shot this, got what I needed. And the very last frame, I said, okay, folks, one more. And I said, I'd like to title that picture Moon Over Rochester. Well, they took me serious. They all started turning around like, oh, no. I said, no, 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 I'm just joking. We, fortunately, I caught it fast enough, I should say. They would have done it. I'm telling you, they would. And that would have been an interesting picture. <laughs> Once, when you're taking someone's picture, they pretty much will do anything you ask them to do. Speaking of group shots, this is at the UN. This is back in the, towards the end of George, the first George Bush's uh, term, which would have been the late 80s, I guess. And the UN came to Kodak and said, could you make a group shot at the UN at the General Assembly meeting, which is done every September, of all our member nation states, all the, all the heads of our member nations? And we said, sure. So uh, Bill Kafer and I actually shared this assignment. And we went to New York that summer and scouted out the United Nations, started looking for a place. We knew where the delegates were going to be coming through. They were coming through this area to go into the General Assembly Hall. So it was a perfect place to do the group shot. Here we are setting up our lighting. These are, we had three or four assistants on this job. I think about four assistants, actually. Not an easy project. Uh, major picture. You can see by the equipment we have, that's my 4x5 camera up on an elevated platform. Then we've got these very large light boxes. This is an overhead view. The stage they're still building it is on the left where the delegates would be standing. I'm all the way against the windows on the right with the camera. You can see there's probably five or six bounce lights, background lights. All. It took a day to set that up and test it. Here's a short video the UN did during the shoot. Oops, there you go. There's little name tags. Those little white tags are name tags. And every, every delegate had to stand in a very specific spot. So it's like herding kittens, you know, it's very, it's not so easy. Everybody wants to talk to everybody else. Okay, settle down, you know, we need to get this picture. Margaret Thatcher. Bunch of Secret Service, lots of Secret Service. That's Bill Kafer. Bill did the floor work. I'm up at the camera. He's running around getting everybody in their spot. There, my assistant's loading the camera. They gave me a microphone. Everything I would say would be instantly translated into French, because that's the other official language of the United Nations. And we're shooting. I shot four frames. I, didn't, I knew these people had no patience for this whatsoever, so I wanted to get what I was going to get, and then I'm done. I'm, look, I'm scanning them as fast as I can to make sure everybody's in line. Smile, look at the glass. They were pretty obedient. I had the attention of all the world leaders for five minutes. I could have said, okay, I want all your money. And they probably would have given me all their money. As I said, you just don't know what the next assignment's going to bring. Now, that's not the end of the story, though. They had, Kodak had made an offer that we can give everyone a print of this. They can leave that day with a print. Okay, great. <laughs> Not so easy. So once we made that fourth exposure, we were in a cab on our way to KNL Labs, get the film processed, pick a hero frame, and make 200 and 
whatever prints and put them in a frame by the end of the day so that these people could leave. So that we were only half done when I made the last exposure. Corporate photography, a little different from advertising photography. It's, it's things like the annual report, it's press releases. It's, it's like everything else, usually directed from inside the company. Yeah, Kodak makes microelectronics, and you, you've all been there to these labs. You have to suit up like this person just to get in. I've got pictures of myself I'm not going to show you in, in the same garb. Annual report. This is actually the first annual report cover I did. I think it was 77. Yeah, 77. And in 77, Kodak was still pretty fat and happy. Their annual report color co covers were usually pictures like this, pretty pictures, pictures that appealed to their share owners in a, in a traditional way. Later on, though, business kind of got in the way, and it's like, okay, now, now the annual report is a little more than just a bunch of pretty pictures. Also, I'm sorry, this is in, in between George Fisher when we introduced Advantix. Uh, there was an in-flight magazine that contacted us and said, could you send us a picture of Mr. Fisher with the new Advantix? So he was, he was I photographed a lot of CEOs in my career at Kodak. He was, he was probably the friendliest one. They all were friendly. But because we were close in age, we had a lot more in common. So he would enjoy, for him, the studio, coming to the studio for a picture was kind of a break. He would come down, generally be in a pretty good mood, and, and stay as long as you needed. This is later, uh, what is that, 93. Matt Volpe, who I know is here, was the art director on this. And we were given the task of, we got to show Kodak as a worldwide company. How do you do that? So we thought, let's, let's go somewhere other than Seattle. Let's go somewhere other than Chicago. Let's go somewhere in the world. Somewhere exotic, by the way. Somewhere that doesn't look like the United States. So we chose Hong Kong. Actually, Kowloon in this case, which is the more traditional part of Hong Kong. Lots of planning, lots of back and forth between the Kodak people as we were in Rochester. Okay, we need, they don't have, their trucks look like this, but they're never painted like this. So we made arrangements for them to paint a special truck for us. You know, we're going to be there on such and such a date. Uh, I know Jody Cobb. She's a photographer at the National Geographic. And she had just completed an article on Hong Kong. So I called her and said, what do you think? Where should I go for this? She said, you got to go to, she said, you have to go to, Hong, to Kowloon. That's the only place. If you want it to look Chinese. So that's where we went. Here's Matt supervising the, the painting of the truck. They paint trucks outside. They're, I don't think they have body shops that have walls. They basically just paint the truck. And they were doing, literally doing that on the street. Now there's lots of stories on this one. I'll tell you the first one. Actually, Scott's, I'm looking at Scott right here. Scott Hamilton was my assistant on this. And we had everything figured out. We had a location. Truck was ready to go. We had radios to communicate with the truck. All good. Ready. Let's go. Truck shows up at the intersection. Take a couple of frames. And this, this camera had like a, like a lever that you would advance the film with. Got a couple of frames off, and the, film, the camera lever just came off. Came right off the camera with some of its screws following it down into the dirt below the camera. We looked at each other. We were in shock at that point. Like, now what? Well, anyone knows Scott, he's prepared. He had his grip kit right there, his little micro screwdrivers. He found the screws. We were all down in the dirt looking for them. By now, the truck had gone. It could only stay for the light change, and then it had to go, make its circuit, and come back. By the time that truck was back for the next shot, that camera was working again. We were off, and we got the shot. Come back with the shot. Remember that? So we come back to Rochester and tr crop it and do all the stuff we need. And then I think it might have been Matt. Someone thought, you know, maybe we should show this to someone who reads Chinese. Just <laughs> why not? You know, because we didn't. We had no clue. Well, we were in an interesting neighborhood. Let's put it that way. So we ended up, I think Matt worked on it in Photoshop to either Greek the lettering so it didn't mean anything or turn it into something that wouldn't offend anybody. So we had no idea. We're like fat, dumb, and happy. Yeah, great. Let's, that's a pretty picture. Yeah, maybe. 
another annual report. This, this was a 13-day around-the-world trip on this one to show Kodak uh, products being used all over the world. And a lot of pre-production on this. Most of this is pre-production. You've got to figure out how you're going to get there, how you're going to meet these people, how you, what day you're going to do it. It's, it's, it's a pre-production nightmare, basically. But if you do it right, it works. We started in New York. Our first shot actually was in New York City. And our next stop was Stockholm, Sweden. Well, in New York City, one of my Hasselblad cameras blew up. Scott wasn't there. And we no time to even fix it. So we took it with us. Well, guess what? Hasselblads are made in Sweden. That was our next stop. So we found in Sweden, we found the local repair place. And they fixed the camera right on the spot, literally fixed it. And I said, how much? And the guy said, Kodak, right? And he said, no, no charge. That business card <laughs> really helped. That's the raw shot of that. That was shot on the street in front of a Kodak Express store. This was the guy in Sweden, uh, this uh, radiologist. Paris, in, in kind of cold weather. As you can tell, we were freezing, they weren't. This is India again. This was in front of Victoria Station in Mumbai. And interestingly, I had hired some people to keep the other people out of my picture. I thought that would be a good picture. Just, and in India, it, it's wall-to-wall -wall people. So we had security, and they kept it clear. And we shot a bunch of frames. Matt and I are looking at the Polaroids, and yeah, looking good. And then we thought, you know, this is India, for God's sakes. You need the people. This, this was a, a photojournalist who worked out of Mumbai, and he was one of the early adopters for our digital cameras. That's why he's in the Inner Report. So we let the people in and just drag the shutter a little bit so that they'll be a little bit blurred. They won't be the obvious subjects. And that's how you do it. Again, how do you make the picture better? Take the picture, but then how do you make it better? There's some of our helpers. That's Matt, actually, the art director on, on the right of me. That's our guide in India. And then all other art, extra art directors, in just case we need them. When you set up a camera and lights in a country like India, you, you instantly get an audience. We travel light, not really. A um, couple of suitcases and then all this stuff. And my assistant, Eric, took this picture. It was the three of us on this around the world trip. Very tight itinerary. The, the good thing about this trip, it happened at a time that United Airlines was doing a thing called Star Alliance. They were aligning themselves with a bunch of other international carriers. We flew around the world for like a thousand bucks. You can't fly to Cleveland sometimes for a thousand bucks. This is back in the studio. This is Howard Bingham, um, photographer uh, of most of Ali's career and confidant of Ali, uh, one of the greatest guys you ever want to meet. And we set this up. Matt's idea was, you know, it's boxing, let's put Howard in a boxing ring. So we got a boxing ring and set it up in the studio and lit it. There's Matt clowning around with Howard. He's wearing, actually wearing Ali's gloves in this picture. And with the right lighting and the right amount of smoke machine, you, you get an interesting picture. Television. Uh, another part of my job was to work with television companies, television production companies, while they were making Kodak commercials. And the reason for that was we wanted to make sure what the claims they were making about the film or the camera or whatever were somewhat based in reality. They, they always weren't, but sometimes. And we also had to provide still images that were usually used at the end of the commercial kind of as a wrap-up shot showing you what those pictures look like as still pictures. So we'd often be in Hollywood for three or four weeks working on a series of commercials. The first one, though, for me was in Rio. It was an international commercial. I was, it was very early in my career. This is a pre-production meeting. I actually had hair at that time. 
This was all done with a Brazilian production company. They did the whole thing, shooting on Kodak film, of course. This just gives you a little flavor of what TV commercials are like to work on. And you know every bit of this, but... It was a real eye-opener for me because the level of production on these things is amazing. I learned a lot initially from working on television shoots. There were about four commercials that were shot in a week. And my job was to get stills that could be used for other things afterwards, for print ads and posters and all that. So I tried to stay out of the way. I still had to get the same, pretty much get the same shot that the film cameras were getting. This is an interior soundstage scene. Everything's double, two child models, two dad models, you know, everything is, they just make sure they're gonna get it. They can't not get it. Two, those are two dads, and they just see which one does the best job. That's the wrap party. And that's the results. This is what I, my part of it would look like this. This was not a still frame from the commercial. This was actually a, a picture taken on Kodak Gold film. And this was interesting to me. Some of you probably know how to do this. This looks like they're looking in a mirror, right? Well, probably back to the very earliest days of filmmaking, they said, forget that, because we're going to see the camera. So they cut a hole in a wall and they use duplicate props. I thought it was brilliant when I saw it. It's like, oh, that's how you do that. More, of, more from the shoot. We, we had, there was print ads for all of those different commercials. That's the beach scene. Okay. Sorry, I don't know why it's, there we go. Okay, another video. This, I believe this is Advantix. This is an Advantix commercial. Yeah. Most people make sense of this view. What I do. Okay. This is a particularly well art directed commercial, I thought. Whoops. There wasn't really a still frame there, sorry. I don't see smoke coming out of the booth. Think, oh, are we okay? We're, we're calling up to the booth right now. To okay, check. thanks, Nick. There it goes. We've all seen things nobody else has ever seen. There are beautiful pictures in all of us. All I need looking at is some people see our Now, the interesting story here, this was before Advantix even got on the market. These are all produced before that. So we're the only people on the planet that even have those cameras. There were also only two labs in the world that could process that film. One was in Rochester, one was in Dallas. The commercials were shot in Hawaii and Calgary. So every afternoon after the film crew wrapped, I gave the film to my assistant. He got in an airplane and flew to Dallas spent the entire night while they were processing the film, flew back on the earliest available flight so that those prints would be available to the film crew to complete the commercial. Just gives you an idea. Now, money, no object at that point. It's like, just do what you need to do kind of a thing. A lot of times we're in Los Angeles where there's a print lab virtually on every corner, but with this particular format, that wasn't the case. It just adds to the interest, and I, I found it fascinating. I loved it. 
I really did. What format are we in? Colorama again, because the camera could shoot panoramics. Portraits. I started, I think I told you, doing mostly advertising. And I didn't do a lot of people pictures, but I became in love with them as, I, as my career progressed. This is George Lucas. The, this, this was shot at a TED conference. We set up a little mini studio in the green room before these people would go out on stage. And we would offer them a picture. You know, we're from Kodak. Would you like us to take your picture? And most of them said, yeah, I'd love it. Some said no. This person happened to say yes. John McCain, interesting guy, just like I thought he would be, very personable. He wanted to know more about me. What do you do? And I said, well, I work for Kodak. I'm a photographer. He said, that's a great job. And I said, sir, you're right. That's a great job. Yo Yo Ma at a different conference, or Yo Mama, as Leonard Bernstein would call him. He had about five, 10 minutes with these people, but that's enough. As long as you're ready to go and set up. Bill Nye, the science guy, crazy as he appears. <laughs> this is Matt Groening, he's the creator of The Simpsons. These are all, we're in digital era now. These are all with a digital Hasselblad. This is not film, we're shooting. And, and the deal here was we came up with the idea at this particular conference, let's photograph, it was over three days. So we thought, let's photograph these people and then let's make a gallery in one, this was at the Getty Center, which is north of Los Angeles. And let's put up a gallery. We'll print the pictures on, ink, on large inkjet printers and we'll build a gallery as these days progress. That way the people can see what Kodak products do, all of that. So they agreed to it. This, these are some stills from the gallery. Big, these are 30 by 40 inch color prints that we made. Some of the people in the green room declined being photographed. They're like, eh, nah, that's okay, I got plenty of pictures of myself. Well, then they started seeing the gallery develop and they came back to the studio and said, would you mind? I said, of course not. So we got virtually everybody to be photographed. It was, it was a great idea. It was fun to do. And it was all digital, so we could do it quickly. We could get them cropped, retouch, and put up very quickly. Come on, a little more. This is Moshe Safdi, he was uh, in that same group. He's an architect in Canada, a very famous architect. And he liked his picture a lot, so I got an email from him not too long afterwards. He said, the, the Kodak Canada Post is gonna do a stamp with me on it. Do you mind if I use your picture? And I said, of course not. So, give me a second. That's a block, that's a proof block. Moshe's down in the right. I actually got a credit. That was the only, one and only time one of my pictures appeared on a postage stamp. I should have asked for some sort of a royalty or something. But. It's trying. There we go. You know these people, I think. They don't need any introduction. This was, also, this was at a digital conference. It wasn't a TED conference. And these two guys had not been together for many, many years, but they came together to talk at this conference. So they were both in the green room at the same time. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'll photograph each one individually, but boy, wouldn't it be great to get them together because people haven't seen them together in quite some time. So Steve Jobs came with a publicist. Uh, Bill Gates came by himself. So I asked Bill, I said, you know, I'd like to get a picture of both of you. And Steve was kind of off in the corner on his iPhone, and his publicist looked at me and said, that's, she said, that's never going to happen. And I'm like, okay. But I caught Gates looking at me at the corner of my eye, and he kind of gave me a, an expression, just give me a second. So he went over to Steve, and he said, come on, you big baby, get over there and get your picture taken. <laughs> and he did. So we took the picture, and it's up on one of our big cinema displays as it's being retouched. 
And the publicist comes over to me and she said, can I get a copy of that? And I wanted to say that's never going to happen, but I, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So I said, of course. And that day on Apple's website, on the splash page, on the main page, was guess what? That picture. They were great. They, I wanted them to do other stuff like back to back and kind of, they, they nixed that instantly. They're like, no, 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 we're not doing that. This guy is a Kodak guy. He invented the digital camera. This is Steve Sasson. That's his digital camera. Fortunately, miniaturization came along, thank God. But he came to the studio. This was much later than 1975 when, when the whole idea of him being the inventor of it came up. So he brought this thing, it looks like a science project, basically down to the studio. And there it is. That's literally the very first digital camera that he invented or built in 1975. He did pretty well with that invention. He's getting a technology award from uh, Barack Obama. Big deal, that's, that's the highest award for technology there is in the nation. And after he got his medal, he said, can I come to the studio for a portrait? And I said, of course. Great guy, by the way. He has stories that would you know, how did this all happen? You know, what, did you, what did they say when you came up with this invention? He'll tell you the whole thing. It's, it's, fa it's a fascinating story. Along my career, now, this kind of gives you an idea that you just didn't know what you were going to do. It, you didn't know what the next assignment would be. That's what kept it fascinating. We had a deal with the PGA. We were a sponsor for a couple of years. So I went out on the tour for two years and photographed virtually every tournament for that year and then the following year. And I'm not a golfer. I know very little about golf. But in a way, that was an advantage because I was shooting it from the perspective of a photographer, not a golfer. I enjoyed it. I, it was a, the PGA is an incredibly well-run organization. Golf is a very predictable sport. You, know, you pretty much know where everything's going to happen. And you, you, your job is just make sure you get a good picture. This is shot from the MetLife blimp. This is Torrey Pines, which is near San Diego. And I wanted to get a picture showing the beauty of this golf course. It's, it's just amazing how this is carved out of these, these headlands that are up uh, in Torrey Pines. So because MetLife and Kodak had a relationship, all I had to do is make a phone call, and I got to ride into the bet life blimp to make this picture. It was just, okay, no problem. Again, business card worked out. I think we know this guy. It's amazing to me how good these people are. Not, again, not being a golfer, but just see the precision that they do their sport. It's just, and when they're not playing, they're practicing. If you look out of the corner of your eye, they're, they're moving the club. They're moving a ball. They're, they're, they never stop because it's at such a level that they can never stop. This is at uh, Palm Beach, I think. This brings us to lifestyle photography, the last category. And I mentioned to you why this became an important, important category because of the need to come up with these pictures, kind of like snapshots, except maybe more aspirational snapshots that could be used to show the back of a camera, show the cover on a, on a uh, Kodak inkjet paper package, you name it. Some of these were professional models. This was on a, on a shoot that I did with Ogilvy in New York. These were hired models, but it's pretty much seamless between this stuff and then John and I came up with the idea that, what if we just go to some country and start looking for pictures? And they were, they were always complaining, saying, you know, the pictures you're giving us, they all look like they're shot in New York. Well, they were pretty much all shot in New York. We want sp Spanish people in our pictures. We want Germans in our pictures. We want people from Singapore, and we want Asians in our pictures. So we came up with the ideas that, Instead of trying to find them in Rochester, why don't we go to where they live? So we spent, John, I don't know how many years it was. It was many years, 10, 10 years, traveling sometimes two different locations a year, 
showing up in the country, finding a producer, a woman, of course, had to speak the language, and that was our entree, so that as we would go around these countries and look at pictures, we had someone to ask. You can't just walk up to someone and point a camera, especially a child, you can't do that. So we would have a producer with us who would make that initial contact, tell them we were from Kodak, which in most places they instantly recognized Kodak, and they agreed to do it. We came back with scores of pictures from all these countries for a fraction of the cost to hire professional models, as in this situation. And they signed a release. They signed a blanket release, and our end of the bargain was, we'll send you a picture or pictures. Because in most cases, they didn't have good pictures of their kids or of themselves. So to them, that was much more valuable than money, getting that photograph. It was an accounting nightmare, by the way, by the time we got back to the studio and tried to figure out where that person actually lived and what the address was and all that, but it, it got done. This, this, was, uh, this was professional as well, and we'll, we'll get through them. Sometimes we needed a specific demographic or a specific look that we did have to find that uh, at a modeling agency. This is very specific, too. This was at a home in Miami. We were doing a multiple of things. One was this little dock printer. Oops, sorry. And of course, we used the model for other things, too. Let's do a picture of her, too. Let's not just make her a mom. Let's make her a pretty girl. This is an interesting picture. This, this looks simple. Maybe it doesn't now that I've gone through all this stuff. You're probably saying, no, of course, it wasn't simple. Again, herding kittens, herding cats, herding geese, equally difficult. And we started getting nothing. This is a couple of proofs from the shoot. This was our initial tries. Terrible, absolutely horrible. And we're freaking out because we've got an afternoon, that's it, the light's gonna go, it's over. So the farmer worked somewhere else, but he came home from his work and he said, how's it going? And I said, it's not. I said, it's a nightmare, I'm not getting it. He said, what do you want? I said, well, all I want, I want it to look like this little girl is actually lifting her hands and moving that, those geese forward. Oh, okay. Because geese travel together. I don't know what it's called. It's not a flock, I don't think, but there must be a term for it. And they go with a leader. And wherever the leader goes, they go. And as we were shooting, they got fed up with us and just took off into that meadow behind the shot and stayed there. <laughs> okay, now what? So he, got, he jumped on his ATV, and he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get them, and I'm going to bring them around behind your shot, and I'm going to aim them back towards your camera. Great. So I told the girl, I said, honey, you stay right there. That's your spot. And when I cue you, you lift your hands, and you smile. And it worked. That's it. Those geese are out of there. And a second later, they're on their way back somewhere else, and he's scaring the geese out of them on the way behind them. But sometimes you just have to figure it out. Sometimes that, that's the fascinating part about doing this kind of photography. She wasn't at all afraid of them, fortunately. She was not, she was fearless. John and I did this in Bermuda at a school, I think it was. But you get this kind of spontaneity. It just happens. It just happens. That little girl looks up at her friends and you take the picture. Singapore. These are, these are real kids doing real things. This was not. This was shot in Rochester, near Rochester. But we want to make it look real. That, that can sometimes be a challenge. This is in Toronto. Also Toronto. That's back in the studio on our psych. This is in Oregon, in the sand dunes south of, uh, well, south of Portland, but closely more south of Eugene, I guess it would be, right? They have these beautiful sand dunes that just don't even look at all like what you think Oregon looks like. We found a family that was camping there, and the kid had a kite. And okay, take a picture. 
And pictures don't always have to show a face to, to make a good picture. Also, sand dunes, these are sand borders. We had actually hooked up with these people and arranged a shoot because they were doing this. I had never seen this done. They actually use what looks like a uh, skateboard. They actually use it on the dunes. This is Nice, France. This is the same day we actually arrived from New York. We still had daylight. It was like 10 o'clock, I think. And we didn't go to have a nap because we had flown all night. We, we go, we shoot. If the light's good, we're back out. We're looking for pictures. And this little Moroccan girl was with her family in Nice. And you know, it was interesting as a Kodak, as any photographer, when you point a camera at somebody, you're looking right at them. You really get a sense of what they're thinking and what their thought process. She was thrilled to do it. I said, just do a little dance, you know, and they, and she, she didn't know me. She didn't know John, never seen us, but that's, that's how real pictures actually happen. This is also in Nice. This is um, my good friend David Magellan's daughter. She was our guide, our producer for that particular shoot. She spoke French. Now, John had the foresight to make sure that he had a pretty hat and a pretty dress so that if, in fact, something we stumbled on something like this, we could put Mary in the picture and get. You need a person. I'm not a big fan of landscapes that have no people in them. I like some sort of human element in my pictures, and Mary provided that for us. Whoops, blank frame, there we go. Mary again. Lavender fields, very similar to tulip fields, they're everywhere. This is in Singapore. This was a shot John and I, or a project John and I kind of worked on together. Part of it was with Ogilvy in New York, and then the other half of the shoot John and I just did. Real people in a park in Singapore. This is much closer to home. This is Geneva on the lake. Some, this, this could be Europe, though. There'd be no, it, you know, could be Italy, easily be Italy. This is not a hired model. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the organ. And I want to talk a little bit about how special this place is for me, it really is. Not only because it's a, it's a great photography museum, but it has the world's largest pipe organ in it. And I've always loved pipe organs, I really have. So the opportunity to work on this and to play it was, it, it was just a godsend to me. And I was retired, I was looking for something to do, it was perfect. This, if you ever get the chance, and I know some of you have the chance, but others who haven't, you, you really need to get into the house and hear this organ. It's, it's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. Working on it, not so much, but it's a million different parts going in a million different directions, but it's fascinating. To me, it's fascinating. I also did talks about the organ as I was, would, would be playing it, I would take time to explain to the visitors what this thing was, how it worked, all of that kind of stuff. That was fun, that was a lot of fun. The best fun though was this, playing this thing. It is a monster, but it is a heck of a lot of fun to play, it really is. This was shot not too long ago, about uh, two or three summers ago, I was doing a project up in the Adirondacks. And I got up early, they had a cabin for me at this location. And you know, you're in a strange place, you don't really sleep that well. So I got up early, looked out, and saw there was mist on the lake. So I just had to, I just had to go out and photograph it. What format do you think I chose? <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. So we can.
I'd be more than happy to open it up. Thank you. I'd be more than happy to open it up to questions now, if you'd like. I'll do my best to answer them. I've got a microphone, so if anybody has a question, I'd be happy to come on over to you. I know we, we went a little bit over time, so I understand if anybody also has to leave as well. <laughs> we get that. Okay, someone's got to have a question here, right? I have a question. My husband is shooting, um, he's a digital photographer, and I want something very large. And he says since it, we don't have any negatives on the digital camera that he won't be able to reproduce a large picture. That he's, he's, he's trying to shoot a picture or he already has a picture? He has the picture, but it's on my phone, on my digital phone. And oh, it's on his phone. Yeah. Okay, well, there's a million online services where you can send that picture to and they'll print it for you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Oh, come to he's the not market. allowed to ask questions. By the way. <laughs> Everyone's scared of what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am more than anyone. <laughs> I don't have a question. Okay. I have a thank you uh, for doing what you did. You... You inspired a lot of people, and I don't think you realize the impact that you had on a lot of other people who not only were assistants who worked with you, your, your co-photographers, uh, anybody who just looks at images, you, you, they, you, what you did inspired them. And I want to thank you, too, for the time we spent together. Uh -huh. uh, you you re really had a tremendous impact on my career, and, and thank you so well, much, Steve. It was awesome. It's mutual, Jim. Absolutely mutual. Anybody can top that. No. <laughs> if, if there's one other question or comment or... Yeah, comment. Uh, <laughs> Who hated this? Anybody? Oh, oh there's a lot of hands. Now. Any more praise? Oh, we've got one up in the balcony. Let, I don't want to leave the balcony. folks in the wow. balcony out. All right, go ahead and let, yell down. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> were, were you the guy in the foreground that dropped his pants first? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you all had sunglasses on. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good point. Yeah. It did work. I needed you guys front lit, not back lit. So that was one of the, you know, thank you for being there, by the way. Was the lunch worth it? Or I'm not sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, thank you again, Steve.